Good morning, saints of God. Good morning. Hallelujah. It's wonderful again, as always, to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Uh, this is a beautiful, wonderful privilege. That I thank God for the opportunity to be able to enjoy with you, the saints of God at Holiness Revival Ministries here, in anticipation of all gathering together in eternity with the Lord. Amen? Amen. As we sing his, his presence is heaven to us. This morning, the message that the Lord has sent for us is intended to deliver us, those of us who continue to struggle, those of us who continue to have difficulty, with presumptuous sins, with habitual sins, who have difficulty to lay aside besetting sins, and whose faith are weakened as a result of it. Today, I sense on me not a preaching anointing, but anointing to teach this message so that we would receive the fullness of our salvation that God has given to us. Amen. God has given to us, and we are to receive what God has given. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the message that you have placed on my heart and you have sent for us. Lord, we are mindful, Lord, that the message is not only for those who are to receive it, but the messenger is also, the one bearing the message is the one also to whom the message is sent. So we thank you, Father, that you have sent this word to us. We pray by your spirit, O oh Lord, that the eyes of our understanding this day will be enlightened so that we can see, O oh God, the riches of your goodness in us in Christ Jesus. Let your will be done through the ministry of your word. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you turn with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It is a very familiar text. And it is placed in the context of all the people who, through faith, have, have pleased the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11. Reading from verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he, God, is, and that he is the rewarder of them who diligently seek him. The title of the message would be the challenge to our faith in overcoming habitual or stubborn sins. The challenge to our faith. We often think of faith only in the context of receiving things from God answers to our prayer, for our daily needs and desires, moving of mountains, problems in our lives, healing of our sicknesses, attaining our goals and ambitions, etc. 
we, when we talk of faith, we think of faith to achieve or to obtain or to come into these things. While faith impacts all these things and all these things are in order, there is something we need to realize or need of faith also. We need to realize our need of faith in the context of our salvation, experiencing what God has done for us in our lives. In other words, what Christ has done for us, what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, we, we, we require faith to appropriate it, to receive it, and to experience it. Amen. So not only to receive a, a, a blessing, per se, or to receive a favor, as we would, or something else that we may pray for that is, I would say, objective or external, but our salvation. This is vitally important. It's vitally important. For without faith in the finished work of the cross, we could never be truly victorious in life over sin. And if we are not victorious, as I said before, we will be in danger of becoming cold, becoming lukewarm, becoming discouraged, at best, or we backslide at worst because we did not appropriate what God has said that we have. For example, we have received the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we see in the word of God that we are now saints of God. We see in the word of God that we are now freed from sin. Don't we? But it is not our experience. Stay with me now. We do not feel that that is so with us. Stay with me. Because we are not experiencing the victory, the things we have done or do. We, are, we know they are not consistent with someone who is freed from it. Am I speaking to me alone? Come on. So that we are looking at our actions, looking at ourselves, and we are failing to appropriate. We cannot reconcile this thing. Lord, you have freed us from sin. And we come to church, and we hear that we ought to put off the deeds of the old man. We try to put it off. Here we're not supposed to fret. Who was here Sunday? <laughs> fret not. And by 8 o'clock Sunday night, I am calling pastor to ask him, <laughs> By 8 o'clock Sunday night, I say, but didn't you just hear fret not? I know you're saying, Brother Glenn, it's you who harden. <laughs> it's you who. What I'm saying here to us today by the Spirit of God is that when we hear of faith, we think about receiving things. We are so preoccupied with it. But faith is important for that which God has done in us or that which the scripture has revealed that God has done for us. To experience that in our lives, we require faith. Amen? So that is why I titled the message The Challenge to Faith in the Victory Over Habitual Sins. 
I, I want to put in context before I go, for, uh, go on that uh, we do understand that sanctification, the process of holiness, is progressing. Okay? So, I'm not saying that because we got saved, all the things that we used to do, we stopped doing them. We got saved on Sunday, and by Monday we stopped doing them. Or we got saved in January, or by December we stopped doing them. And it's not because God will take so long to do it in us. But like everything else, there is a process of growth. And growth is over time, over a period. And progressively, we become. The more we imbibe the word of God, the more we re remain in Christ, the more we submit to God, we grow. But when 10 years gone, when 20 years gone, are we battling the same thing? We need now to take an account. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now I know if you're sitting here and you say, okay, I ain't make 10 yet, so I have 10 to go, nine more to go. No, it's not, I'm just using numbers to show the context of the message so that we would understand that the Lord knows what we need and that he has sent his word to bring healing to our hearts and to our souls. Amen? Amen? Now many a child of God will confess to being defeated by this or that sin, by this or that habit, by this or that conduct or behavior. Now, we know a pastor, one strong on behavior, we sit under his ministry, we sit under his example, we sit under the word. But if truth be told, we're not taking no census, uh, action or show of hand. The same behavior he has been talking about since we joined the church, we still have it. And it's not that we do not know. It is not that we do not try. But we have not succeeded. If you are honest, you would understand. I'm not asking for a show of hand. You'd understand what God is addressing. That dilemma that remains in our mind, it is a dilemma. How, 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 how to come? Lord, what am I doing wrong? Lord, what? And on top of that, the enemy of our soul, the accuser of the brethren, sits on our shoulder. Tell you, you ain't ready yet. You ain't saved, not you. You have to take a sabbatical. <laughs> and when you're ready, then come back to church. You see what you're doing? And to which you say, amen, I agree. <laughs> and next time, some brothers see you. How are you? All right. A long time I say, I, 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 I come in. <laughs> Since we know our besetting sin, and although we try to lay them aside to run the race of faith, we have not been successful. We feel weak, we feel defeated, our own hearts condemn us, and as a result, we conclude, I need deliverance, I need, I need, I need to be delivered from something, something is wrong with me. Now, this may be so, but listen to the word today. We say we need to be delivered as a result of our failures. And this song's holy, and this song's good, and this song's right. And there are times we need to be delivered some, from oppressive spirits, from spirits of wickedness that continue to oppress us. And we need to be delivered from it. But on, in, in the general sense, we need to look at what the scripture has said concerning what Christ has done in us. In Colossians 1.13, Colossians 1.13, it 
It said that God has delivered us from the power of darkness. Is that in your Bible? Colossians 1.13? Is it on the board? Yes, Colossians 1.13. Let me back up again and, and let's look at the context of that scripture. Verse 12 says, Given thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet or fit. He has made us fit. We did not make ourselves fit. That is verse 12 we are looking at before we go to 13. Giving thanks to the Father, which had made us fit or meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. I will put now before I go to verse 13. Giving thanks unto the Father who had delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We did not deliver ourselves from the power of darkness. We did not translate ourselves into the kingdom of his son. Amen? Amen. Who did that for us? God did that for us through Jesus Christ. Oh, remember the message, the challenge to faith. But we must believe that even in our difficulty, even in our failure, even in our weakness, the word of God did not say he will deliver us from the power of darkness. <coughs> Look at it again. Please, verse 13, who hath, the tense is specific, it is past, he hath done it. Yes. Hallelujah. Right. When I read that and the Holy Spirit, of course it's a text I'm always quoting. When the Holy Spirit showed me that I had one big grin on my face, you could see all 32 teeth. <laughs> you see, what it did, it made me realize something. That I am trying to do what God has done for me. I am trying to do what God has done for me. In another message I preached, I think it when it was dealing on Friday, the last Friday I ministered about overcoming guilt. We have received a glorious, wonderful salvation. The glory and the wonder about it is that we have not done it for ourselves. As Paul has said in another text, that he who has begun will continue. God has begun a good work in us. And he will continue to the day of Jesus Christ. So when he sends messages like this, and oh, messages will be here. When he send the word to warn us that we should walk in the spirit, that we should, all these works of the flesh, we need to put them down. We understand that he is doing the work in us that he has begun. Amen. Let us look at another scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And I'm making the point of what God has done in us. And what we would say to ourselves that we don't feel it is, a, a, it is our spiritual experience. We don't. We have not appropriated, and most times we cannot appropriate it because we feel that our actions are so far off from what it is said that God has done. Second Peter 1 verse 3. The word of God says in this text, according as his divine power hath given unto us, listen to the saints, 
all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who had called us unto glory, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having, having escaped. He didn't say when we will escape. He did not say so. The text again is past. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, do we feel, do you feel that you have escaped the corruption of this world? But the word of God says that you have. Okay, let's cheer this page off. Could we? Because you and I are not feeling so. Remember, the word of God is a challenge to our faith. And I have said that we need faith to be able to appropriate, to be able to come into the spiritual experience of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Now, if God has delivered us from the power of darkness, and if God has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, and if he has made us partakers of the divine nature, and if he has given, not if he will, you know, if he has given to us all things that pertain to life and, godly, and godliness, how come we think that we do not have it? How come we feel that we do not have it? Why do we remain defeated and why we are still looking for something else? Do you understand what the direction of the message is? We need to believe God. Faith is believing God. It is taking God at his word. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. It is not of works. It is not of your doing that you will boast. If therefore you were not saved by your doing, would you be sanctified by your doing? Okay. Put another way. God has saved you by his doing. And now he tells you sanctify by your works. Is that what, does it seem to reconcile? I know what is playing in our mind, you, uh, and you don't want to answer because, well, but, but then what I have to do? <laughs> what I have to do? But I have to do this, I have to obey this. Uh, yes. And how long you have been trying now? Come on, preach with me. I'm not preaching today, I'm teaching. How long have you been trying? When are you going to get it right? When are we going to overcome it? Let me speak for myself. There are many things I have tried and tried and tried and failed. No, that's me. Maybe, as we said before, I hadn't. Maybe I bad. But I obtain my deliverance and confidence in God when the Lord showed me what he has done in me. So God has said to us, that he has done these things for us. He has given to us all. Which means we do not lack. If
if God has given it, what are we asking him for? Because if you ask him, he say, I give it to you. Our pastors always taught us that if a gift is given, you don't have it until you do what? Until you ask for it. Is that what he teaches us? What, what? Come on, he's right here, you know. He, he, he teaches it all the time. Am I correct, Pastor? If a gift is given, we do not have it until we ask for it, right? Until you do what? God wants us to receive the deliverance that he has wrought for us in Christ Jesus. Okay. You see, this here is the first of our challenge to faith. And this is a major challenge. That when we hear the word of God, we doubt. We do not accept it. We will not believe until we see all the things we want to happen first happen to us, and then we will accept it. We doubt. Like doubt in Thomas. Unless I see. Now, could you understand the, is it the, we say in Trinidadian language, the audacity <laughs> of Thomas? He is looking at the risen Lord. Okay, let me show you. Whether or not Thomas believed Jesus Christ was risen, never change the fact that Jesus Christ is risen. You agree with me? But here is Mr. Thomas imposing himself into the picture and telling the Lord that I will not believe except I put my hand in the nail print and I put my hand in the side. Jesus entertained him. He says, see Thomas, look Thomas. And he said, do you believe now? Blessed are they who see not. So that the blessing of our salvation comes to us through faith. Hallelujah. Through our belief. Not through anything you have done or will do. And you believe it. If you believe it, then, no, sorry, if you see it, then there is no faith. You don't have faith for what you see. I, I don't know anybody seeing thing and they, have, they haven't faith for it. That does not seem to, oh, oh, let me, let me show a parallel in the Old Testament that we are familiar with. God told Joshua when after Moses died that he must rise up now and take the children of Israel over this Jordan into the land that I have promised them. God told him that. He further told him that every foot of ground that you tread on, I have given, he never say I will give you. With God is always past. He has done it. God has done it for us. Say, this is the gloriousness of our, our salvation. This is the power of the cross in our lives. This is the power of the resurrected life that he has given us in Christ Jesus. This is the hope. This is the rejoicing. This is the source of giving of thanks. This is our glory. But you see, religion teaches us, and we have over the years. Tell ourselves that we must work something and come into it. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm confusing. Because let me say this at the outset. Some things are not readily grasped. And some, and spiritual truths are to be discerned. Not always grasp it with the natural mind. But don't sit and doubt it. Because if you do, you doubt in God. You see, 
No flesh will glory in God's presence. Because if you and I could stand up and say, Father, listen, I sanctify myself. <laughs> you know I sanctify myself? I stop smoking, I stop drinking, I stop. And I sanctify myself, Lord. So now, Lord, which heaven are you going to? Then you didn't need Jesus. Oh, no, you say, well, you have the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, I sanctify myself. Please understand the context of what I'm saying. That we put an emphasis on us doing. God wants us to place the emphasis on us receiving what he has done. And it's, it is done by faith. The thing about it is that we would never know what that faith will wrought in us. We will never know. The victory that we will experience over the things that we have been fighting, unless we do that, accept it. And be ruled by it, and be governed by it, and be changed by it. And many times we go through over and over the same thing. And sometimes we think we're failing because we feel weaker and weaker and weaker. Yes. And sometimes we feel broken because we know it wrong. And we do it and we feel broken. And we wonder, well, how God hasn't left me yet. God waits now until we are at the end of ourselves. And he says, okay, now receive what I have done for you. You ever wonder why God waits 400 years to bring the turn up? Israel out of Egypt? Think about it. I don't have time to go into that. You wonder why God waited so long after the fall of man to introduce salvation? One reason that comes to my spirit is that we would always think that there could have been another way. And as long as we continue to think that our our Sanctification could have been wrought without Jesus Christ. And I don't mean without him dying for us. I mean without us being in him and living in him and yielding to him. If we believe that we could do it, then we will continue to try to do it. Alas, we will find out that God has ordained that it is in Christ that it is achievable. It is in Christ because he is our sanctification, not we. So I said this is our first challenge. There are four real major challenges to our faith. And the first here is doubt. We allow the devil to snatch away the word of God from our hearts through doubting. So you hear the preaching of the word of God and you say, I believe that. No? So you put yourself now above God. And, 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 and once the devil says that, he snatches that away from you because that word will produce faith in your heart. It is, will produce faith in us because that is what God says. It is always, always saints of God. Critical that we, we remember that God's ways are not our ways. No, it is not. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. So when we hear the word of God and it doesn't line up with what we think it should be or might be and we doubt, we cannot get the benefit of it. It was like Naaman who was told to go and dip in the river and you will be clean, go and dip in the Jordan. But he thought that the prophet will come and lay his... Now, what do you know about laying on hand? He had leper so long, you know they lay on hand for leper? He never even know that the prophet could do it. But we just have a notion that something should be a particular way. And this causes us to doubt the word of God at our own peril and at our own distress. We just saints of God need to believe God. Yes. Let me ask this. How do you know that your sins are forgiven? Hmm? You sure? Well, you also said, well, okay, the answer, and Kenneth is right, that you, we know our sins are forgiven because God says so. Yeah. 
Okay, tell me how else. If it's not that, because part of the conversation, the, the congregation ain't looking so sure that the sins are forgiven. <laughs> it's go, number one, you can't forgive your sin. That's all. You could only commit, right? <laughs> and you're good at committing. But the forgiving part, you have no power over it. And God says, I forgive. <laughs> As a matter of fact, hold on. I don't have time to go into this. But may I remind you that the scripture said that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he done what? So far has he done what? How do you feel that your sin is still with you? Why does the devil make us feel that our failures are still with us? And sometimes even after we confess. But it is God's doing. And I can come into it. I can now have freedom of conscience, freedom. And deliverance from it because I accepted God said so. So if he said that he would forgive his sin, is the same God who said that he has delivered you? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. We believe that Christ is our deliverer because somehow Christ will one day deliver us. But Christ has already delivered us. God has already delivered us. How? In Christ. Now, keep that phrase uppermost in our minds and our understanding if we are to appropriate it. You see, he has not delivered us in ourselves. He has delivered us in Christ. What is this in Christ thing? What is in Christ? God has dealt with us in Christ. I know terms, spiritual things are not always readily grasped. Not always readily grasped. The word of God says the natural mind receives not the things of the Spirit of God for the foolish unto him. Because how you telling me I am delivered? I didn't tell you. God tell you. And you and I have to reckon with God. Go to him. Lord, you told me you have delivered me. Look what is happening. Go to God. He said, Ask him to give us a revelation of our deliverance. Yes. Right. Maybe I have to leave my notes. But as I'm on this point, let me show us how God has dealt with us in Christ Jesus. God created the world. He created us. Whatever God does is good and is for a good purpose. And sin interrupted that. To deal with the world which he loves. Don't tell me God will love the world. Think God loves us alone in holiness revival, in holiness revival ministry here. Yeah. No, he loved the world. That way he wants us to go and talk to them. Right? To deal with the whole world. John 3, 16, for God so loved whom? The world. Understand this. So that to deal with this issue, the transgressions that his holiness and his justice must, ju must judge. To deal with the nature of the full man that continued to produce this injustice, this wickedness, this adultery, this fornication, this lies, this anger, this theft, this wickedness, this envy. We are, we are like factories producing these things. How would God deal with that? I know you would say he gives us the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't make us do anything. Or the Holy Spirit make you do it. I, Holy Spirit was given to you to guide you into all truth and to reveal to you Jesus Christ. To work with you as you would yield to him. 
You know, you know, you can't work with some people. You know why? Even when you can't work with some people, I can't work with you at all. <laughs> Listen, I believe the Holy Spirit tells God that I would mean. You see, Glenn, I can't work with you. But no, you see, it's love. You see, we are like that with people. As people come out of line with us, wait, hold on, wait, wait, hold on. Not me and you. So when we hear love of God, we believe God so. No, God, not so. Give me the Holy Spirit. He didn't give it to you because you, 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 uh, you have attained a spiritual condition to uh, receive it. That's why another thing, many Christians don't believe they receive the Holy Spirit. How oh, I have the Holy Spirit? Are you doing that, boy? Drinking and smoking, boy. More than I used to be before I say. I ask you a question that before you were saved and you were smoking and drinking, you had no conviction. So who do you think convicted you? You? You see, we think so much of ourselves. We don't see God. And what God wants us to do is to look away from ourselves and look to what he has done. We think of ourselves. We think that there's goodness in us. Paul said it in, 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 in Romans 7. Within in me, in my flesh, there is no good thing. He, he didn't say there has been or had been no good thing. And now there is, you know. All our goodness comes from our unity with Christ. It is our unity with Christ that breathes the life of God into us. That is why we need to abide in him. That is why we need to stay in Christ. That is why we need to walk in the spirit. Because if you don't walk in the spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yeah. But isn't that what the scripture said? Yeah. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill it. So God has dealt with us in Christ Jesus. He's our life. He's our sanctification. How did he do that? He viewed us in our sinful state, concluded all under sin, took the sin of everyone, laid it on Jesus Christ, and he dealt with it there so that he does not have to do, de deal with it with us. He raised Jesus from the dead. Gave. And Jesus gave us his life. The life of his Holy Spirit. And he gives life to all those who would come to him. What God signified. There is no life in that flesh. How come you and I looking inside us to see goodness still? We will not see it. So we we look into ourselves to try to find the answer and we find what confusion of face we somehow look into us and believe well, I, I could do this <laughs> we use willpower and we come up short have you ever seen a tree trying to bear fruit? A tree just bear fruit? Have you ever seen a branch in a vine trying to bear grapes? The branch just bears the grapes. Didn't Jesus say, abide in me and I in you? For without me, you could do nothing. The life of God, the life of Christ will necessarily flow through us if we remain abiding in God, abiding in his word. Yielding our members and ourselves to God, walking in his spirit, walking in the spirit of love that he has given you, the spirit of truth that he has given you, the spirit of light that he has given you. We are no longer in darkness. Let us therefore not walk as those who are in darkness. 
In other words, with our sins, God dealt with them directly. With our conduct, or our behavior, or our nature, he deals indirectly in that. He has done with that in Jesus for us now to submit and surrender and yield and see the, the fruit of the Spirit being born in our lives. I do not know how many times in this church I have come from hearing a message that may have touched on Galatians 5 that deal with the fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh and make a list and say, okay, I drop off this one, I drop off that one. Well, this one hanging on a little bit, so I'm dropping off this one. And I'm trying to produce the fruit of the Spirit. I am trying to produce it in my life. I have no patience with my wife. Why? Because that fruit is not born in my life. So what fruit is born in your life? Is, is that a fruit of another spirit? It's one spirit bearing all the fruit. So the, 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 the thing for us to do, saints of God, is to find our delight in abiding in God, in his word, in his purpose. Find our delight in abiding in truth, in abiding in love, in abiding in prayer, in abiding, in, in making it our place where we take residence, sanctuary, abode. It must be our constant place. Now, when we hear that now, we believe that, look, this is, this is, this is, this song in so you're this, thing, this holy, holy thing, you have to be holy, holy all the time. Immediately when that thought comes to you, you can see what is happening. That in your flesh you are preferring anything else outside of Christ. But everything outside of Christ is death. Christianity is about life and death. Christianity is... Is life and death. God is serious. He wants our life to give us life. We have to give it to him. But if we want to do the things of the flesh and the things of the world, then we could have no life. There is no life in them. And the point I'm making here is that so we don't have to try to produce the fruit. The fruit of the spirit is, it is a fruit of the spirit. Now, it's not many fruits. We have heard that. And the fruit is produced as we, as the vine is in the branch. Are you all getting this? The, the vine is produced, not when the vine go along the road and do some push-ups and, and fix itself well and thing and pray. No, the vine abides and the fruit is produced our responsibility, as Paul put it in Romans 12, our reasonable service is to present our bodies, yes, our bodies, as a living sacrifice. Our reasonable service. So I identify the first challenge to not our faith in receiving what God has given us, the things that we have read, all things that pertain to life and godliness, translation of um, deliverance from the power of darkness, translation into his kingdom, inheritance in the saints. The first thing, first challenge is doubt. We doubt, and as a result, the devil comes and snatches out the word out of our heart. This is what Jesus taught in the parable of the sow and the seed. Our second challenge to receiving to our faith is our lack of understanding or no revelation of the word of God to us. It is needful that the scriptures be explained. 
For this purpose, preaching and teaching are gifts of the ministry of the Holy Spirit for the edification of the saints. However, not all explanations of scriptures are simple and straightforward. You see, the wisdom of God is foolishness on the man. The ways of God are far above the ways of man. The things of God do not always come ready to the intellect. They must be spiritually discerned even though they may be taught by a gifted teacher or gifted preacher. Jesus said to his disciples this in John 16, 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. And again, Peter acknowledging this in 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 and 16. He said we must account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Peter is saying to the saints that Paul has written, has been given wisdom by God, and he has written it unto you. All, as also in all his apostles, verse 16, in all his epistles, rather, speaking in them, in the epistles, of these things. And hear what Peter say. In which are some things hard to be understood. Isn't that in your Bible? What I'm saying to us is that a hindrance to our faith is when we do not have a revelation of the scriptures to our heart. And many times, being in Christ has to be re really revealed to our heart by the Holy Spirit. That's, why, that's what we pray for. That's what we see God for. That's what we, 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 we want God to work in us. Lord, you have done this for me. Let me give you another scripture. I am crucified with Christ. Is it? Paul that was crucified with Christ or we were crucified with Christ? Me ask you, were you crucified with Christ? Do you feel as though you have been crucified? Then if you have been crucified, you are dead. Then if you are dead, you are free from sin. How is this easy to understand? This is the point I wish to make to us. But therein is our deliverance. Because this is what God has ordained. So we sit and we hear a word. And there's some preaching that is very easy to receive and, 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 and go along merry. And there are others that will challenge us. So where we are being challenged by habitual sin, where we are being challenged, and, and there is this tendency to not want to go on, but you know that you have received Christ. Then, what, then here is where you and I need that revelation of God, of Christ in our heart. That I am in Christ Jesus. And all that is in Christ Jesus is mine. My deliverance, my victory, my everything is there in Christ Jesus. There I must abide. Hence the reason, and this is no small wonder, that Jesus said if you continue... More than anything, I would hope that this message will make us continue in Christ, despite what is happening with us. Because if we continue, we will know the truth. So you may not receive this message today. Don't throw away the tape. <laughs> Hold on to the tape. Maybe go, the Lord might send pastor to preach the same message in a different way. And I, and I love the method of the Lord. He yeah. said, one man preach, another man water, and who give the increase? God. What, what is all of this to tell us? No, no, no. Don't give up and chuck in your faith. Don't turn back. Turning back is death. Don't think that God is fed up with you. A come that is long suffering with you is a salvation in your life. Don't let the devil say, God do always try with money. You see, you is a matter of time. Listen, if God wanted to get you, to get you a long time. You'll go, to the, you'll go to the cross and then you're looking to get you. Do, you. do you understand what we are buying into? Now, hold on. 
God's spirit will not always strive with man. That's true. He said to you that he wouldn't leave you nor forsake you. He has put his spirit in you. And he wants you and I for his purpose. This is the faith that we must appropriate. When we appropriate that, now we could deal with it. But if we go and say, well, oh, maybe, maybe, well, maybe, uh, and, uh, I think I do too much. There is no sin deep enough that Jesus can cleanse. There is no sin big enough uh, for God. For you and I, it has good sin and big sin and serious sin. And, <laughs> and we think about that, but that is not our Lord. We think so much of our own fault that we miss what our salvation is about. We have heard that, that, that Jesus Christ is called the last Adam. Haven't you heard that before? What do you think that means? That means that there is no more of Adam race. Adam race is ended in Jesus. No more Adam. And anybody not in Jesus, in Adam. And if you're in Adam, die. That's what salvation is about. This is God's righteousness now. This is he, salvation is not only to our individual sin and shortcoming and weakness. It is God's order. He has set up the world. He has created it and sin interrupted it. And now he has sent the last Adam. That last Adam. He ended that. The flesh, what is flesh is flesh. There is nothing to expect from it. There's nothing to expect out of your life. You could make a million dollars. You could achieve whatever you want. You could be whoever you are. If you're not in Christ, die. That's God's salvation. But this is the power of the resurrection of Jesus. In that Jesus Christ rose to give life to all and to translate them into God's kingdom. He's not translating big sin or little sin. Or, no, he's translating those who are in the spirit. His, his spirit is in you. He translates you to his kingdom. So the difference between our lives is whether we're in the spirit or whether we're in the flesh. In the flesh we die, in the spirit we live. So what we are doing when we look inside and we try with all, all feeble efforts, without yielding to the Lord, we are trying by works to appropriate what God has done for us by grace and we will not succeed. So those are two main challenges to our faith. We hear the word and we doubt it and two, we hear the word and we do not understand it. There's no revelation. So two, that causes doubt. A third, a third challenge is that we hear the word and our preoccupation with the things of this life make us go away from it. Our preoccupation with this present life. Simply put, our love of the world, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, those things crowd out the world. That's what Jesus taught in the parable. That's why he said, don't love the world or the things in it, because it will challenge your faith. And then, if your faith is challenged, you cannot appropriate what I've done in Christ for you. Because God is ending all of Adam's creation. That is why he didn't call Jesus the second Adam. If you say second, there would be a third. He's the last. Have you ever heard that Jesus Christ is the, is the, is the second man? Yes, the first man and the second, yes. Or put another way, he's the firstborn from the dead. Have you ever heard he's the firstborn from the dead? The firstborn from the dead. Why is he the firstborn? You and I are going to be after him. Yeah, well, the sons of many brethren. Because that is how God is going to populate his kingdom. By those who are made alive from the dead through Jesus Christ. Not through their own efforts. Our faith and our reliance is on Jesus Christ. For our salvation and for our sanctification and for our deliverance. Now that is the doctrine. That is the truth of the word of God. We need now to believe it, to receive it, and to seek for revelation in our spirit. So that we will come into the experiences and that we will see that we are producing the fruits that we ought to produce in our lives as we abide. Are you getting anything from this? I hope so. 
Our fourth major challenge is something that we call reckon. The reckoning of faith. What I mean by that? We talk about having faith, having faith, good, 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 good. But faith reckons. To reckon is to take into account. To reckon is to take into account. The word of God said, reckon yourselves indeed to be dead to sin. Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. Reckon yourself. Reckon yourself. That's how you're dead to sin. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin. And the verse is Romans 6, 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God through righteousness, to true Christ our Lord. To reckon is to take into account, to account, to consider the facts. Reckoning is not make-believe. It is not pretense. It is taking the facts into the account and forming conclusions based on them. Why does God want us to reckon ourselves to be dead? Because we are dead. No, that is a little difficult to grasp. Go, you pinch yourself. Me are dead, no, brother Glenn. You must be dead, buddy. But you see, again, it's not what you said. It's what God says. This is why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. And we believe that Paul is talking of himself. All that are in Christ have been crucified with Christ. If you were crucified, then you were? For the grace of God that constrain us, for we thus judge that if one man died, then all were dead. Do you understand these things readily? Okay, put another way. If I pay your light bill, if I pay the light bill for everybody inside of here, TNT can't come and tell you that you didn't pay. Why? Because I paid. So if I paid, you paid. Uh, am I correct? Yes. If Christ died, then you died. Yes. Then I died. Yes. No. But, but the Glenn Roy, this thing is, how is it? Reckon, reckon, take into account, consider what God has done. Your faith takes hold on the past. Faith doesn't take hold on the future. No, not necessarily. It has hope for the future. It has its object in the future, in future outcomes. But it takes its base. It takes its foundation. It takes its strength from the past, from what is settled, from what God has done, from what is completed. That is what our faith is based on, not what will be. We can trust God because he has said it and it is settled. And our faith is on that. Not what he will say. What Jesus has said, what God has said is that we are crucified with Christ. So our faith must appropriate that to ourselves. You understand why I open by saying we need faith to appropriate our salvation. The fullness of it. Now if we do not, we remain as Christians who will believe that one day we will overcome and that we have to go on being weakened by our transgressions, being weakened by our failure, and one day probably we will see it. But if we do that, we will, convince, we will be convinced or we will agree that we would not have in our spirits, in our conscience, a victory the victory that Christ has won for us. Amen? Amen? And our fifth, as I close, I mentioned the fifth real challenge is exactly what I've been talking about. Our temptation and our failure. We must understand that the devil is a skillful liar. And he will employ all and any means to cause us to doubt the truth of the word of God. So if he lies, he lies skillfully. So what he does, he comes again and he tells you, you not translate it. Because you see, what you do, you know, nobody translates it to do that. And you say, amen. No, God says you are translated. So if I am translated, I am translated. You start there. You and I start there. Start believing what God has said about us. It is so critical and vital, saints. Satan's temptations are to get us away from our reliance on Christ and to look to our own selves to accomplish what God wants. Yeah. yeah, to rely on Christ. You have to work it out. You hear they say, work out your salvation? So what does that mean? Yes, work it out by making sure you abide in, the, in Christ. Work it out by making sure you walk in the Spirit. Work it out by making sure you yield yourself to God. 
That's how you work it out. Not that you try to stop doing something in your own flesh, in your own self. Whatever contradicts the word of God must be regarded as Satan's lies. Our abiding in Christ can produce the desired fruit in our lives and give us the experience that we so desperately need and we seek. We cannot do it on our own. Saints of God, when we stand steadfastly on the ground of what Christ is to us, for us, and in us, the truth of Christ becomes true in our lives. That is the spiritual exchange, the divine exchange that happens with faith and with believing. Remember, the Lord says, abide in me and I in you. That is God's divine order. I thank you very much.
of Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you yes, for your Lord. grace. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for Calvary. We thank you for deliverance. We thank you for so free and wonderful a salvation. We give thanks to you, O oh God, for having delivered us, O oh God, from the power of darkness. Its power has no power over us, O oh God, as long as we remain in Christ Jesus. Father, our prayer this day is that our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, will be enlightened more. And, O oh God, that where we are any area of darkness that we would look to you oh God to enlighten the gloriousness of the gift in Christ Jesus to our hearts so that the power that you have given unto us, the wonderful privilege that you have wrought in us the presence of the spirit of God in us will lead us oh Lord to that place oh God of freedom where we will experience Lord what you have truly wrought for us we thank you Ask, oh God, that more and more, Lord, that none, Lord, will turn away because of temptation. We pray that none, oh God, will give up because of failures, Lord. You have made provision for that. You have said that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So you have made provision as we grasp your sanctification, as we continue to yield and develop ourselves in you. I pray that your people, Lord, who have received this word, we will all grow, grow in the grace of God, grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of God as we yield our ourselves, cause us to see, O oh God, the emptiness, the vanity, the death, O oh God, that is outside of Christ. Cause us to see the folly in turning away, O oh Lord, so that we would cling to Calvary, we would cling to Jesus, we would cling to the cross, and we will make, O oh God, your salvation our only hope for life. We, are, we praise you, we bless you, we thank you for your word, we thank you for your goodness, we thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, and the saints of God say, Amen. Amen. Before I, I, I close, I'd like to make an appeal for anyone who's here today. You are here today, you have attended church, maybe by invitation, maybe you were just drawn to come to church of your own, in your spirit, but God is drawing you to hear the message of salvation, which you have heard today, but that salvation is in Christ Jesus. If you are not born of the Spirit of God, Christ, you are none of His. If you are not born of the Spirit of Christ, you do not have the Spirit of Christ in you. You are in the flesh. And you are destined for destruction. For the flesh was crucified in Christ. God showed His judgment on everything that was born of Adam. That's the natural birth. Today, you need not perish. You need not remain outside of God's salvation. It is offered to all. Today you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You want to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You want to be translated as we are into the kingdom of light, out of the darkness. I want to give you an invitation to do so. I will lead you in a prayer which will make the difference between being in the kingdom of hell in the kingdom of darkness and in the kingdom of God. You're here, could I see by a raise of hand? Would you receive Jesus Christ today as your savior? Would you receive the life that God has given in Christ, would you? If you would, would you slip your hand up? You're under the balcony, you're in the balcony, is there anyone? There's one hand up, is there someone there? Is there someone? Yes, I see one hand up. Is there another person who would receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior? Would you raise your hand up? Would you say, yes, I will receive Jesus today? Yes, I will receive the free salvation of God. Yes, I will receive life. Is there another that will join with that person in the balcony? You can put your hand down, sir. Okay, if there is no one else, I wouldn't ask the person in the balcony to come forward, please. And I will meet you at the front here and lead you in a prayer that would make a difference in your life. 
And if you have not put up your hand and you want to receive Jesus, you can step forward, step forward and come towards the altar and I would lead you also in prayer. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. We are waiting for that person to come all the way from the balcony. We hope that there is none else in the sanctuary who is putting off receiving Christ. None else, no one else who will turn down the invitation. Someone else? Yeah, two other people coming. Thank you. Thank you. Who's coming to receive Jesus? Good of you? Good of you. Three of you. Three of you. Three of you. Oh, this is simple yet profound. God did not make it difficult for you to receive the life that he has given in Christ Jesus. The word of God says, if you will believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, and you will confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart man believes to righteousness, and it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. That's the word of God. You have come forward today so that demonstrates that in your heart you believe. That's the first step. I will lead you in a prayer. I would speak the words, but you must repeat it and make it as sincere as you can. Pray it out sincerely. And it will then be the prayer of your heart. And the miracle of salvation will begin in your life today. So bow your heads so you're not attract, distracted. You're not praying to me and pray this prayer out loud dear God in heaven I come to you this day a sinner your word says Lord that all have sinned and come short of your glory but I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ left heaven's glory I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ came to earth and he died for me. I now accept Jesus as my Savior and I declare Jesus as my Lord. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Put your Holy Spirit in me and teach me to live for you. By faith, I receive you into my heart, Lord Jesus, and I thank you for saving me. Amen. The message today is that it is by faith you receive. It is not how you feel inside. It is not how you feel outside. It is what God has says. It is the truth of your will, of God's will, and is the dynamic power of God's will working in you, working in your obedience, working in your acceptance of His will. And you, today, have been born again a child of God. Born again a child of God born again a brand new baby. As a brand new babe, you need to learn things. Babies need to learn. You are born again. You just received Christ and you need to learn. Standing behind you, there are people who would make an appointment with you. It is not to join this church. It is to take you in the word of God and show you what you have received and how you can keep or must keep that which God has given you that which you have asked for, his salvation in Christ Jesus. So I thank you and welcome you to the kingdom of God. I pray that you will develop and grow in the grace of God. Okay? I will. You, you go with these people.
God bless you richly. You may be seated.